but because it allows you to, to think about threads right from the language level, which is the right place to do threading, uh, to do concurrency. Uh, and the normal thread is still there, the java.lang.thread, we sometimes call it, because that's the, where the definition is. That thread is still there, but it, and it be, still behaves exactly the way it would behave in a standard Java environment. So the RTSJ didn't get rid of the thread, we simply extended the thread. So instead of just the, the normal Java thread, we now have a real-time thread and a no-heap real-time thread. Real-time thread is a thread, so it has all the characteristics of a thread, but in addition, it's also called a schedulable object. That is to say, it can be scheduled. And the scheduling becomes very, very important. It can be scheduled using a fixed priority scheduler, which is the default, so you can set priorities, and these priorities will be honored no matter what, and you have to have some number of them. It happens that you have to have at least 28 uh, minimum, although all the implementations I know have more. The Sun implementation today has 60. Uh, you have a set of priorities, and those priorities will be honored every single time. So you're going to get predictable performance on these threads, unlike the standard Java threads. The no-heap real-time thread is just like a real-time thread, except it can only access scoped in immortal memory. So it's the no-heap real-time thread, because it can never touch the heap and therefore will never be impacting any objects on the heap, it can preempt the garbage collector. Now, you don't want to be doing a lot with, with no-heap real-time threads, but sometimes you need one of those, and when you do, they're there and they work. Uh, you have a very flexible scheduler interface, so you can do a lot with this. As I mentioned, there's a priority scheduler. That's required by every implementation, by the RTSJ. Every implementation must supply a fixed priority scheduler. However, the mechanisms that are put in there are very, very flexible, and additional schedulers can be defined, and there are a number of organizations right now, mostly in universities, that are doing research on additional scheduling mechanisms that will be probably available in the future under the RTSJ. But at the very least, you can get a clean, fixed priority, preemptive scheduler that's going to give you very predictable performance in this environment for real-time systems. As I mentioned, uh, priorities, you get at least 28, but everybody that I know of supplies more than that, uh, including, of course, the, the Sun uh, RTS product. Uh, the next thing is synchronization. Now, I mentioned earlier that Java provides synchronization. You have synchronized objects, excuse me, synchronized methods. You have synchronized blocks. So you have two ways to, in Java very, very cleanly to provide the synchronization that you need. Uh, the problem has been priority inversion. Well, priority inversion is generally handled in most uh, real-time systems by one of two mechanisms. One of them is called priority inheritance, and the other is sometimes called priority sealing, or priority sealing emulation is the more correct way to say that. Uh, in Java, in the RTSJ, priority inheritance is required. Priority sealing emulation is optional. And uh, some implementations supply both. Some of them will provide only priority inheritance. But all of them have to provide one of those two for, by, by requirement on every synchronized block and every synchronized method. So that means when you're running your, your Java application under the RTSJ, you're going to get the, the benefit of priority inversion control on all of your synchronized operations. That has a major effect. Now that has the effect of greatly improving the predictability of your system, which remember, is what real time is all about. The next thing on there is asynchronous events. Uh, asynchronous events are our objects, uh, and they, there's a method for an asynchronous event called fire, and any application that wishes can fire an asynchronous event. You can create asynchronous event handlers that connect to asynchronous events, and by putting those two together, you can create a whole set of things that are triggered directly by operations in the, in the application. They can be triggered by happenings, as they're called, in the operating system. They can be triggered by signals, if you're using a Unix or a Linux operating system. Uh, they can also be triggered by the timer. Uh, so you can have a timer that times out and triggers asynchronous events. That can either be on a one-shot basis or on a periodic basis. You have a lot of flexibility with this whole event mechanism. Uh, from my perspective, event, the event mechanism is almost one of, the, one of the best reasons all by itself to use the RTSJ. Uh, I know of very, very few languages, and in fact, I, can, I know of no languages that provide the capability of the asynchronous event mechanism in the RTSJ completely. It's probably better than anything I've seen in any of the other languages, including Ada. And by the way, I happen to like Ada. Uh, it, it unfortunately has, has not made it very well, and, and I think Java is, is fast taking over the uh, domain that Ada once held. Uh, this, the last thing on this list is the asynchronous transfer of control. 
Asynchronous transfer of control is a mechanism by which one thread can shoulder tap another thread. It can just say, take an exception right now. I don't care where you are, I don't care what you're doing, take an exception right now. Now, the target application, the target thread could be disabled. And in fact, by default, it would be disabled because that's the only safe way to do it. But assuming the target thread was programmed to be able to accept one of these, and in a properly designed system, it should be most of the time, then it will immediately stop, uh, virtually instantaneously, it will stop what it's doing, may not even finish the line of code it's on, and go find an event handler, an exception handler, to handle that, that uh, operation, that asynchronously generated exception. And then it'll go to that exception handler, that'll then clean up its state, it'll do whatever it wishes to do at that point. It could be a mode change, it could, it could be a way out of a, a nested uh, a hierarchical operation, it could be a way to stop the application. There could be a lot of things you might do with an asynchronous uh, tra transfer of control. Very powerful mechanism, not one you want to use very often, but when you need it, you're awfully glad you got it. High resolution timers, there was there's some been difficulties with the resolution of timers in Java, and so we, we added uh, new timers that give you nanosecond precision. Raw memory access allows you to get at specialized areas of memory. These are things you need in just about every real-time or embedded system, and we put them into the RTSJ. Bottom line, is, is it harder to write an application in Java than it is to write a, excuse me, a real-time application in Java than it is to write a standard Java application? The answer is yes. Absolutely. It's always been harder to write real-time applications in any language than it is to, to write non-real-time applications in that language, and that's still true in Java. Uh, transitioning to Java is going to require some pretty careful planning. Developers really need to understand what the real-time mechanisms are. But the beautiful thing about the RGSJ is that all of the real-time mechanisms, all the way from the scheduling to the uh, mechanism for synchronization, the asynchronous event handles, handlers, all of the controls for that, things like periods, things like minimum interarrival arrival times, things like uh, delays and, and uh, deadlines, all of the controls for that are all specified in exactly the same nomenclature, that is, in nanoseconds actually, that you would expect to have, expect to use in talking, in writing your standard documentation. You're not working in processor cycles or or some other uh, arcane interface that makes it difficult to figure out what it all means. It becomes very readable, very maintainable, very easy to use. Uh, as a result, we're, we're seeing a lot of, of, of interest in, in moving to Java, and moving to real time for, for Java. In conclusion, Java technology is a powerful enabler. I think you could sort of see that as you look through the mechanisms I described there uh, for dealing with real time and embedded systems that are gonna be robust. Uh, the RTSJ is intended to fill in the gaps that, that were in the Java language for the real-time and embedded marketplace, and it did it without modifying the language, without losing any of the power of Java or the safety of Java, uh, or any of its other characteristics. Uh, as I mentioned, it is harder doing real-time than non-real-time. That hasn't changed, it hasn't uh, become easier just because we're using Java, but it becomes much safer uh, in doing it in Java than it ever was in doing it in C and C++. Uh, and you want to be careful about transitioning uh, to this, uh, just because anytime you're going to a new technology, it's something to think about, but it gives you a way of thinking about it in the context and in the terms of the application uh, in a much more powerful way. I'm going to stop at that point. I think we're taking questions later. Is that 